Al Gore called her one of our very best science writers, possessing a distinctive and eloquent voice of conscience. With her Pulitzer Prize winning The Sixth Extinction and Unnatural History, she compels us with great clarity to rethink the fundamental question of what it means to be human and to consider urgently the devastating legacy we stand to leave on this planet. As an environmental fellow in residence this year, she has guided the science and nature writing of Williams students, helping them to deepen understanding and raise consciousness. We are grateful for her voice, for her teaching, and for her presence with us today. Please welcome Elizabeth Colbert. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's a tremendous honor to be addressing you uh, this afternoon in this august hall and on this important moment in your lives. Commencement is a key rite of passage, one of the few rites that those of all faiths and all denominations, and also those of no faith and no denomination can fully participate in. It's an occasion that celebrates the accomplishments of each of you whose names will be read at tomorrow's ceremony, and also of a great many people who will go unnamed. Your high school teachers, your friends, your professors, your parents, who have helped make this moment possible. And one of the great things about William's graduation is the way this rite of passage is enacted. Tomorrow, when you pass through Hopkins Gate, you will be moving from one stage of life to another, passing from college, metaphorically, but also literally, out into the larger world. And it may seem naive, or it may seem melodramatic, to suggest that you are making this passage at an extraordinary moment that this particular point in history is special, that you are living in an extraordinary time. But this turns out to be the case, which is both why I am up here speaking to you this afternoon, and also what I want to speak to you about. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the concept of the Anthropocene. Credit for coming up with the term is usually given to Paul Crutzen, a Dutch scientist who shared a Nobel Prize for discovering the dangers of ozone-depleting chemicals. In the year 2000, so right about when you and the graduating class were starting grade school, Crutzen had a kind of epiphany. He was attending a conference, and the chairman of the conference kept talking about the Holocene, which, according to our textbooks, is the current geological epoch. It's the epoch that began when the last ice age ended about 12,000 years ago, and the earth began to warm up, and the great ice sheets that covered places like Williamstown and most of the rest of New England began to melt. And it occurred to Crutzen that humans were so altering the planet, they, which is to say we, were pushing the earth into a new epoch. And he found this idea so compelling that he just sort of blurted it out at the conference. Crutzen is now 82 and in failing health, but I was fortunate enough to interview him a few years ago, and he recounted this story to me. Let's stop it, he remembered saying. We are no longer in the Holocene. We are in the Anthropocene. Well, he told me, it was quiet in the room for a while. A few years later, Crutzen published a paper that took this idea one step further. He compared the impact of natural processes on the one hand and human impacts on the other and argued, pretty convincingly, I think, that humans are now the more significant force. For instance, he pointed out, we humans fix so much nitrogen in our fertilizer plants that we have overwhelmed the nitrogen cycle. We emit so much carbon dioxide from our cars and our factories 
and our power plants that we've thrown off the carbon cycle. We've changed the climate, and the effects of this will be felt at a minimum for millennia. We've altered the surface of the planet, mown down rainforests, and planted monocultures in their place, and we are in the process of altering the chemistry of the oceans, turning them more acidic. We've created entirely new chemical compounds and have produced them in such vast quantities that they can now be found everywhere, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, and also in the bodies of each and every one of us. Scientists who have looked at the geological record have concluded that the rate we are now changing the Earth is probably faster than the rate at which the Earth has changed at any point, any other point, uh, in the last 66 million years since the great asteroid impact that did in the dinosaurs. And scientists who have gone looking farther back in the record to the very beginnings of complex life more than half a billion years ago have concluded that there's probably no direct parallel for what we're doing, that we may be pushing the planet into what's being called a no-analog state. And as we change the planet, we are changing the fabric of life. This is Tuffy. He is a rabs, fringe-limbed tree frog. Tuffy was born in central Panama, and he now lives in a tank at the Botanical Garden in Atlanta. The rabs fringe-limbed tree frog is, or at least was, quite a remarkable species. Male frogs cared for their tadpoles by letting them eat the very skin off their backs. In 2005, biologists collected nine rabs fringe-limbed tree frogs from the rainforest. One of these I was fortunate enough to see firsthand when I visited a special biosecure facility uh, in the town of El Valle, about two hours west of Panama City. That frog, as well as several others that remained in Panama, are now all dead. Three frogs came here to the US, to Atlanta, and two of those are now gone too. So Tuffy is the only one of the nine still living. He has been called the loneliest frog in the world. The reason that he and his brethren were taken into captivity in 2005 was that scientists were watching amphibians disappear from Panama, indeed from all over Central America. And since that time, no one has seen a rab's fringe limb tree frog out in the rainforest, and no one has heard one call. And the species is believed to be extinct, except that is for Tuffy. Back in the middle of the 19th century, when Charles Darwin was working out his theory of natural selection, he reflected on the pace of evolution. No one had ever seen a new species appear, and Darwin concluded, probably no one ever would. Speciation, he argued, was just too gradual for that. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress, he wrote. Nowadays, of course, we can see much more than Darwin ever imagined with all of the tools of molecular biology. And yet still, no one has seen a new species of animal come into being not a mammal, not an amphibian, not an insect. Darwin also made another point. As slow as speciation might be, extinction had to be even slower. Were this not on average the case, then species would disappear faster than they came into being, and instead of a world of endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, the Earth would be barren. And so extinction, like speciation, should be impossible to observe. But nowadays, people see extinction all the time. When Tuffy dies, and that could be any day now, as he is, amazingly, at least 11 years old at this point, I will have seen a species go extinct. There are many biologists working out in the field who have watched several species go extinct. Joe Mendelson, a scientist from Atlanta who was one of the biologists who collected Tuffy, is one of them. I sought a career in herpetology because I enjoy working with animals, he has written. I did not anticipate that it would come to resemble paleontology. 
If you are living in an extraordinary time, then amazing things come to seem commonplace. This is Harapan. He is a Sumatran rhino, and he is about 5,000 times Tuffy's size. Sumatran rhinos used to have a very large range. They could be found browsing from Bhutan to Malaysia, and they were so common that in some places they were regarded as an agricultural pest. But by the 1980s, the species could only be found in small patches of rainforest on Borneo and on Sumatra. And at that point, 40 rhinos were taken into captivity in the hope that they would produce calves. Unfortunately, very few of them did. Harapan is one of the program's few successes. He was born in 2007 at the Cincinnati Zoo, which is where I got to meet him a few years ago. His name in Indonesian means hope. Since the 1980s, the number of Sumatran rhinos has continued to decline, and it is now estimated that there are only about 100 left in the world. And so Harapan, all on his own, represents 1% of the global population. This fellow is Sirocco. He is a kakapo. As with the Sumatran rhino, kakapo are only just hanging on. There are exactly 126 left on the globe. Kakapo are the world's only flightless parrots. They are native to New Zealand, and again, like the Sumatran rhino, they used to be very common. You can read accounts from the 19th century in which New Zealanders complain about how the kakapo are kicking, kicking up such a ruckus that they can't sleep at night. Today, all of the remaining kakapo live on two remote islands where their numbers are just barely sustained by captive breeding. The only one who ever leaves these islands is Sirocco, who sometimes goes out on tour around New Zealand which is how I got to see him last year. So Tuffy, Harapan, and Sirocco, which is to say the Rab's fringe-limbed tree frog, the Sumatran rhino, and the kakapo, are all casualties of the Anthropocene. In each case, the proximate cause of their decline is different. For the frogs, it's a pathogen. For the rhino, it's deforestation. And for the parrot, it's introduced predators. But in each of these cases, the ultimate cause is the same. The world that we are creating is a world in which they cannot survive, except perhaps as exhibits, or if you prefer, as prisoners. This is Joel Sartori. In this shot, he has a red-tailed boa constrictor wrapped around his neck. Joel took the photographs I've shown you of Tuffy and Harapan and Sirocco. Here he is again doing a shoot with a Ridley sea turtle. His project, which sounds and actually is insanely ambitious, is to photograph every captive species on Earth. In some cases, there are still many members of these species left outside of zoos and aviaries and breeding programs, but in all too many cases, there are not. The animals are very rare, and in a growing number of cases, as with those that we just saw, captive animals are the only members of the species that remain. The project is called the Photo Arc, and as you can see, it goes beyond mere documentation. Joel has said that his purpose is to give a voice to the voiceless. He photographs all of the animals under studio lighting against a black or a white background, because, as he puts it, all animals are equal. He even photographs insects in this way so that, and once again these are Joel's words, a tiger beetle becomes as magnificent as a tiger. Joel has been at this project for 10 years now, and he's photographed something like 5,500 species. I'm just going to show you a very small sampling of his images and only images of species on the very edge of extinction. The first animal that you're about to see, the Spix's macaw, which is native to northeastern Brazil, is in fact probably already extinct in the wild. The last one, the Sumatran tiger, is down to a few hundred individuals. 
you will notice that the tiger's image is projected onto a building. With Pope Francis's support, several of Joel's images were projected onto the Vatican in advance of the Paris Climate Conference this past fall. The photo art project was conceived of at a time of grief. Joel's wife had just been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I think some of that grief, grief comes through in his images and also that love. I graduated from college in 1983, which is about a decade before you and the class of 2016 were born, and probably right around the time that many of the parents here this afternoon graduated from college. And at my commencement, we were exhorted to change the world. We'd been taught that the world as we know it is largely a social construct, and as such, it could be reimagined, made anew. Poverty, injustice, oppression, these were not necessary. They reflected choices that had been made by human beings and could be made differently. With enough courage and determination, we, the members of the graduating class, could alter those choices. We could change the world. And I believed that at the time, and to a large extent, I still believe it now. But I cannot hear that exhortation in the same way, and I certainly can't utter it in the same spirit. I cannot encourage you all to go out and change the world because you already are. We all are, just by going about our daily lives, by driving and flying and going to the store and picking up an apple that's come from New Zealand or a bunch of asparagus from Peru. We are all participants in this world-changing project that is the Anthropocene. And all of the many ways in which you in the class of 2016 might want to change the world for the better, the ways you should go out and change the world for the better by fighting poverty and injustice and oppression are going to be complicated, made more difficult, in some cases perhaps even impossible, by these great geophysical changes that you and I are helping to bring about. So I had to think very hard about what I could say to you, what I could leave you with this afternoon on the eve of your graduation. And one thing I thought of was exhorting you to seek to change the world by not changing it, to put your education and your talents and your imaginations to work to minimize our impacts. But that seemed to me to be too pat, too tidy, and too uncomplicated. The world that you are entering is a complex one, contradictory, refractory, and uncertain. A world, as I mentioned before, with no known analog. I would be dissembling if I said that I was confident, confident that you, or that anyone, has the power to alter the trajectory that we are on. As I'm sure you were taught during your four years at Williams, in our analyses, we should seek to be as clear as possible, but no more clear than is possible. And I want to respect that limit. I want to end by saying to you what I feel I can say, which is what I hope for you. I hope that you will neither turn away from the truth of our situation nor be paralyzed by it. I hope that you will have the courage to act 
without the certainty that your actions will make a difference. I want to leave you this afternoon with the words of ta Coates. His book, Between the World and Me, is written in the form of a letter to his son, who, I believe, is just a bit younger than you, graduate, than you graduates. I would have you, Coates writes to his son, be a conscious citizen of this beautiful and terrible world. Thank you, and congratulations. <laughs>